Welcome to the Industrial IoT Spotlight, your number one spot for insight from industrial IoT thought leaders who are transforming businesses today with your host, Eric Walenza. This episode of the IoT Spotlight is brought to you by the Industrial Internet Consortium. The Industrial Internet Consortium is the world's leading organization transforming business and society by accelerating the Industrial Internet of Things. IoT One has been a member of the Industrial Internet Consortium since 2015, and I've personally always been impressed by their ability to facilitate collaboration between hundreds of companies to bring new technologies to market and to jointly address topics like security and system architecture, which are fundamental to scaling industrial IoT adoption. Welcome back to the Industrial IoT Spotlight. I'm joined today by Jim Morris. Jim is the Head of Strategy and Partnerships at Nokia Wing. And Jim is also the Co-Chair of Business Strategy and Solutions Lifecycle Working Group at the Industrial Internet Consortium, as well as the Chair of the Business Strategy Task Group. Jim, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. So today we're going to be discussing the business strategy and innovation framework. But before we get into the details of the framework, let's just cover a bit of your background, Jim. So maybe starting with Nokia, what does this mean? So strategy and and partnerships, this is a broad scope. What's uh, actually the scope of your business with Nokia Wing? Firstly, I'm within the Nokia Wing division. So Wing is a connectivity platform. Uh, We enable connectivity of of all types. So cellular connectivity, low power wide area uh, connectivity, including license exempt satellite, you name it, in all countries around the world. So it's a connectivity platform delivered as a managed and homogenous service. And and that's my home within Nokia. And for that group, I'm head of strategy and partnerships with uh, other outside organizations. Um, I also look uh, look after uh, go-to-market support and consulting support for that division. Maybe before we we dig in here, because I think this is actually quite relevant to our conversation, partnerships. Can you just explain briefly the importance of, uh, of partnerships for Nokia Wing? Because I think uh, really in the uh, industrial IoT space, they are more important than uh, maybe they have been with previous technology waves. Absolutely, they are. So partnerships are crucial for, for Nokia Wing, as they are for, for really any company engaging in industrial IoT. Industrial IoT rec- represents a new way of doing things. There are business models which pull on different elements of, of organizations and, and force companies to work together um, in new ways, sharing data and collaborating to bring new propositions to market. This is a new way of doing business. It's a new way of, of the economy working in many ways. And frankly, what we're seeing at the moment is, is a transition from, from old pre, pre-IoT industries, figuring out how to adopt IoT. And that process of transformation, you know, nobody is a one-stop shop uh, yet. When there's a big shakeout in the, in the industry and, and, and in the economy, we may, uh, we may reconfigure and new titans of the IoT era may emerge, but it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, even some of the companies that previously were, to an extent, one-stop shop, uh, shops in uh, industrial automation, for example, now seem to be opening up a little bit as um, uh, new technology domains that they don't have uh, kind of a world-class competence and are, are becoming relevant. So uh, we'll, it'll be interesting to see how this, um, how this develops. Jim, you are co-chair of the Business Strategy and Solutions Lifecycle Working Group. Obviously, this document came out of this working group, but uh, kind of a higher purview. What is the, what's the focus? What are you guys trying to accomplish? Really, what business strategy and solution lifecycle is about is trying to take the learnings and the technical development and the thinking of the Industrial Internet Consortium and provide a window onto that, um, which is aimed at a project manager. So effectively, it's, it's about de-risking the adoption of IoT technologies. There's obviously a huge demand to adopt instead of things uh, technology technologies. A lot of companies are working from it, working on it, and and basically we realised that you know to effectively be a project manager in an Internet of Things project, you need you know ten years of communications experience, ten years of hardware experience, and ten years ten years of software experience, and nobody has those things. So it's quite a challenging. Uh, thing to do. And I think what we're trying to do is is to educate project managers and senior managers um, and uh, CXOs of companies who are looking to engage in IoT. We're helping them to understand what it is they have to do 
and that's in terms of you know, the scope um, and all the things they need to address and sensible ways to address um, some of the challenges that they will come across. And basically, that comes down to de-risking the adoption of um, IoT technologies. And then today, the uh, discussion at hand is the business strategy and innovation framework. So this is a very impressive document. I think it's gotten uh, been very well received by the, uh, the the market to an extent. What are the origins of this? Uh, where where what was the let's say the uh, original question, the original uh, challenge? Because this was certainly a significant amount of effort that resulted in this um, in this document. So what was the uh, the the primary cause here for you guys to sit down and and it was several companies involved. Uh, effectively, th- th- this business strategy innovation framework embodies the the first level delivery of kind of what I was just describing around business strategy and solution lifecycle. So so this is you know, the de-risking of the commercial aspects and and the idea generation through to you know, through to uh, handing over to solution deployment and the idea really the idea really was to get our arms around. Around the whole problem, um, certainly when we sat down to develop the BSIF, one of the things that really motivated us was that we felt that um, many project managers didn't really know where to start when when confronted with IoT and when looking to adopt IoT technologies. So they might pick our pick out you know five or six top things that they need to focus on, but then miss three or four others. Um, and of course, missing those three or four others you know causes problems in terms of execution and delivery of projects and uh, and, and and so on. And and what we want to do as a group of people and and with uh, uh, effectively, with with the stamp of the Industrial Internet Consortium, so you're certifying that this is a this is effectively an independent thing um, and an industry best practice thing um, was was set out to list all of the things that a project manager or a CXO engaging in IoT would need to think about and consider uh, right through to the point where they hand over projects for deployment. Clear. So this is intended both for a project manager who's who's responsible for the product, and then also for uh, the decision makers that are maybe responsible more generally for the business, but want to make sure that they have um, yeah, all of the bases covered from the technology through the the, the business model. Exactly. Uh, we're, really, we're trying to make sure that, that, that the adoption of IoT is not a step into the unknown. Um, it's a step into something which which has been dimensioned and scope and, and is a known envelope to address. Why don't we dig a little bit into the contents here? So we're starting uh, first with the market context outlining the the opportunity. I think this is something that at a high level, people understand, right? These numbers have been kind of thrown around by different uh, different corporates for a long time. So, okay, there's a big opportunity, but how do you view this from a, a, a product manager perspective, maybe somewhat of a, of a bottom-up perspective as opposed to kind of the 50 billion devices? This is the problem with the, uh, with, with the big forecast numbers. They both overestimate and overemphasize the opportunity, but underestimate and don't adequately communicate the impact that IoT is going to have. So the reality is that IoT is going to transform business models, it's going to transform the economy and and the way that we work. And that's a much more fundamental concept than just connecting 50 million devices. And I I think that we try to pull that out in our analysis of some of the business and market drivers and and, and societal drivers, recognize that, yes, there are big numbers, but but actually let's move on to to the significance of this. And and actually it is significant to every company and, and every enterprise. When I talk to a lot of companies, it's actually the business element or the the strategy element that's often more interesting and to an extent more perplexing than the technology. So if you, you know, I feel like a lot of companies feel like the technology is um, okay. In some cases, it's still underdeveloped, uh, under development, uh, but generally speaking, it, it's something where they feel comfortable evaluating what are the options out there. But then when it comes to the business model, there's a higher level of uncertainty regarding, you know, will my customers um, adopt a new process and opt to do a pricing model and so forth. Is this kind of what you're getting at with the strategy element is uh, looking at innovation in how IoT technology allows you to, to alter the way a business is run? Yes, uh, yes, and, and 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 that's a key concept. There are different groups of companies which are looking to adopt IoT technologies, or two broad categories, and some are really just seeking to automate and make more efficient the things that they already do. The others are are taking a view on what their customers actually want and trying to find a way to better deliver those solutions and to, and to restructure their businesses to better deliver to those needs. And it's the second approach, which really is which really is the right approach to take with this. 
I think um, intuitively, the second approach is the right approach. It's certainly not the approach that many companies take, right? I think many companies kind of, okay, this is what R&D is produced. Now, how do we sell this? How do you talk to companies about this? Or how, how do you talk to companies about how to shift? Because this is a, it's a mentality shift. It's a, it's a shift in terms of how their business is structured, their innovation is structured. So it's not a, a simple kind of eureka moment. There's actually some work that needs to get done in terms of changing how you bring a new product to market. Uh, yes, there is. And, 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 and it's, hard. It, it's hard to do because in many ways, it's impossible to point to the future. Um, it doesn't exist yet. So it, it, it's hard to underline how, really how things are going to change. But often there are comparables. Um, so no matter what industry uh, a, a company might be participating in, you can look at you know, other, other comparable industries, you know, th- things that are happening, for instance, in the aerospace industry and the power by the hour there and the way that um, you know, some smart cities applications work. And you can look at the transformation and the transformation in fleet and some of these things and apply those to across industries effectively and underline that business models will be changing. And then I think the thing to do, it, it, once that concept has been accepted, is to get the right group of people in a room and just workshop the situation. Say, well, really, what do our customers want? You know, are, are we, you know, are we selling, you know, are we selling drills or are we selling holes? Um, you know, what, what do people actually want? They want a hole in the wall, but they feel like they have to buy a drill. Well, is it actually a drill they want? And it's about it, it's about establishing that customer need and trying to better deliver it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, I was talking with uh, with Stan Schneider, uh, who I'm, I'm sure you know well, about uh, around the you know connectivity earlier this week. Uh, he had a great point, which is people still, and, and you know, traditionally, but but really still today, uh, primarily look to other companies in their own vertical for inspiration. And this is uh, not very productive often in in IoT. You have a lot to learn from what other verticals are doing around maybe the sim, you know, a similar use case, a similar business model. And uh, it's it's really more uh, productive to say we're trying to build a particular type of uh, value creation model. Now, which other companies have done this? And very likely, they're going to be companies that are in completely different verticals that might be two or three years ahead of us in terms of adopting technology. So this is also a, you know, maybe a broadening of the, the scope of uh, vision. In the document, you, you then kind of outline the, the process of uh, ideation and, and so forth. Is this based on, I mean, I guess there's kind of the lean startup methodology. Are you, are you kind of leaning on that for inspiration or is, do you feel like there's a different uh, methodology for how to have a more effective uh, ideation model for the industrial uh, internet? So the business model innovation uh, segment that was very much uh, drawn on, on on the experience of um, Bosch Software Innovation um, and Veronica Brandt, who spent a lot of time workshopping with clients around, you know, uh, uh, specifically around what's different about the instead of things. And the first element in terms of her approach is more traditionally aligned in terms of you know just looking at production optimization. So that's doing the same things but better and more efficiently, effectively. And then the IoT piece is very much looking at the, the new business models, and that's the very open-ended and blue sky brainstorming. And that's the piece that's different from, from more traditional systems integration, I think, which focused more on efficiencies um, within an organization and within the delivery of a service or a solution, rather than really transforming what it was that was done and, and generating new value networks of partners. That's what's new about IoT. A high level, we could kind of divide this into two categories of solutions. So one would be a product that is being sold to a, a third party, and then you could have new ways of creating value or, or of monetizing a, you know, a process or data. And then on the other side, you would have our internal operations and uh, new ways of creating value for internal stakeholders. Do you kind of take different approaches for teams that are tackling these different issues, or is it the, the same fundamental approach, but then just kind of different groups of stakeholders? No, it's quite different, actually. So in terms of production optimization and doing, you know, making products more efficient, it's classical re-engineering approaches. So you would get people from the business, you get to get stakeholders from the business and identify where the pressure points are, where the pain points are, where the faults are on the production lines, et cetera, and just you know, go back through root cause analysis and fix things. That's a fairly standard uh, re-engineering approach. The new concepts, the new IoT concepts, very much are, are, are more blue sky in nature and you need to start reaching out to customers, you need focus groups, you need user groups and, and just facilitated conversations to try and understand really what it is they, they, they need, because obviously they'll be in the mode of being used to consuming what it is that the market offers them. And you need to somehow get behind that um, to understand w- what they need and, and better match those needs. And, and then I guess you have a class of solutions that are kind of a 
amalgam of both, right? So if I if I'm thinking about, I believe Adidas has some new facilities where it's uh, mass customized shoes. So you you go online somewhere, you select from tens of thousands of different options, and then it's uh, automatically you know sent to the supply chain to the factory. Very small workforce in the factory, so highly automated. Um, and the shoe would then be, uh, you know, delivered. And so you have kind of very few human touch points. You have mass customization. You have kind of a, an e-commerce solution. So you're changing the path to market of the product to an extent, cutting out the distributors. So it's it's a new from the customer standpoint. It's a new way to buy shoes. Um, you have new type of uh, offering. So you have much more ability to to customize the the product from a supply chain standpoint. Uh, it's uh, it's radically different. From a, a path to market in terms of the distribution network, it's also different in terms of some of the you know the traditional retailers and distributors might not be there. Uh, and then from a manufacturing standpoint, you also have new technology. So you have a lot of different ways that the system is changing. It's in, in that case, you could say it is kind of an operational solution, but it's certainly not an optimization. It's kind of a radically new solution. How do you approach uh, more, you know, kind of complex um, situations like this, where there's many, many different stakeholders from your end customer through, you know, internal divisions and and then also um, partner organizations or or suppliers who are all going to be impacted by this uh, this solution? Well, all concepts like that start off with an idea, and that's why ideation is is key. Um, so it's an iterative process. It's not just about sitting down and saying, what can we do to make, you know, with one group of people saying, what can we do to make our business more efficient whilst not really changing what we deliver? And then another group of people in saying, what can we better do for clients? Once you've come out with either those workshops or those efforts, those initiatives with a, with a list of ideas, you need to you know, start feeding that to project teams and asking them what could then be done with the, you know, assuming these new capabilities. So if you have a new production capability, what might you ultimately be able to do with that that changes the customer proposition? This is to some extent why it's quite important to have, and one of the things that we suggested within the document was uh, implementing an industrial IoT center of excellence. And this is a group of folks within an organization, which, which really is an internal consultancy capability. And they focus on identifying and, and applying industrial IoT best practices, enabling you know, change management, you know, rethinking business models, and figuring out how human resources need to, need to change and the profile of human resource needs to change to adequately support the business in, in, in the IoT era. So, I mean, these things have to start from ideas, but you do need to bring in some, some expertise. And, and, and as you were mentioning earlier, and, and you were commenting from the, the stand commenters, you know, you're bringing in some learning from other industries. One of my personal favorite references is, is to look what happens in the aerospace industry. The assets in the aerospace industry are very expensive and it makes, uh, it makes business cases quite easy to cost in. Um, and it means that you know, they, they, they tend to be really quite advanced in the way that they have adopted IoT, and many of the concepts that are present there roll out across other industries. To some extent, you know, the, the future is already here. It's just not particularly well distributed, and you, you need people who, f- who focus on that. You're absolutely right. And this concept of uh, um, IoT center of excellence, interesting. I, I do think we are starting to see companies set up either... Actually, I haven't seen... I don't think I've seen many centers of excellence. What I've seen is more individuals that have this role. What would your, maybe based on your experience, either at Nokia or, or with other companies, how would you suggest that a company take the first steps towards setting this up? And, and then where would this sit in an organization? Frankly, it's almost what I do within Nokia, or what I'm responsible for. And the place that I sit within Nokia Wing is supporting the sales channels effectively. So uh, you know, as, as, as and when you know, Nokia identifies or Nokia Wing identifies opportunities, I, I, I might help them you know, help those end users um, understand really what it is that can be, uh, that can be done with the Internet of Things. So yes, I think it's, it, it grows organically. It grows from having people in the organization or identifying people who, who effectively will begin to be that center of excellence um, and, and who will build um, assets and, and PowerPoint slides and guides and information and use cases and benchmarks and reference cases and all sorts of things and just own that and, and, and push that out to the, parts, the other parts of the organization as they need it and also you know, supply some kind of you know, consulting support when questions come up and people, folks in the other parts of the, the organization you know, 
you know, are, are trying to figure out how to adopt IoT, just making sure they come back to the center of excellence. So I think it very much is an organic process. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And companies um, you know, have different places where they're they're starting this initiative, right? It could be on the product side, it could be on the operation side of operations, manufacturing or logistics and so forth. So there's always going to be a starting point that's driven by business necessity and, and the business case. Let me make a, a quick uh, maybe shout out to the Industrial Internet Consortium, because if you are starting quite fresh on this. Really, the IIC is a, a center of excellence that's available to all members and also to an extent to non-members. Of course, members have access to much you know, much deeper information. But uh, you know what you're talking about here, Jim, in terms of developing you know documents and processes and being able to help advise and, and answer questions, these are things that uh, members of the IIC have from each other, uh, which is uh, an incredible resource to be able to ask somebody from Bosch or Siemens or Nokia how would you address this and, and bring that knowledge into your, your organization? Yes, exactly. And I mean, that, as an overall explanation, I think you're spot on. In the specific case of the business strategy innovation framework, we had people you know, contributing from, from an industry analyst, Mikin Research, that's myself. Um, we had uh, Veronica Brandt, I've mentioned, from Bosch Software Innovation. There's Ken Figueredo from InterDigital. And there's Steve Haldeman from Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So this, this was a pro- and, and, and reviewed by many others within the IAC. So this was a product of many people's thinking. And that makes it a better thing than, than any one individual or individual company could have done. And not only that, but it makes it independent and it becomes a reference source in a way that no individual company could create something that is a reference source. Because this has been reviewed by the IIC community. If I, in my Nokia life, um, step forward in front of a client and say, look, we did this piece of work. Um, these are probably the things that you need to think about if you're adopting um, IoT technologies. I can say that and I can reference the Industrial Internet Consortium and I can say that it's industry best practice. And that is a much more compelling story than if I'd come up with the same list of things myself. And also much uh, more efficient to do uh, than starting from scratch. Jim, the last section on the... The document, I think, quite interestingly, is the industrial IoT platform. And this is a, um, I guess you could call it a, a, a set of technologies that I think is particularly interesting because it is so challenging to define. So there's a lot of companies out there that are talking about their platform, right? their IoT platform, and they often do radically different things. They can be around connectivity, they can be around building apps, but they're, I mean, certainly very central to the business and also very interesting from a business model perspective because they all, to some extent, have some of the the Apple Store, uh, you know, kind of that feel of a platform that other companies can use to create value, right? And so there's some scalability to them. How do you view the IoT or the industrial IoT platform as kind of a category of technology? It is a crucial category of technologies, without doubt. I mean, platforms are basically the place where scale hits the Internet of Things. And frankly, uh, scale and exchange of data really are the secret source of the Internet of Things. So they're a very crucial concept, um, both in terms of efficiency of deployment of solutions, but also in terms of you know, the secret source that is the Internet of Things and, and combining multiple data sources across from multiple players. So it's an absolutely crucial set of technologies. Technologies. It does look, I mean, we, we've come from a history where you know, there's been a lot to talks about platforms and many companies have put themselves forward as, 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 as platforms. And it does look now like we're getting to a situation where people are, um, where platforms are more focused, I think, than they were in the early years of the IoT. I think in the, in the very early years, a platform company would, ha- would have a focus, but would try and do as much as possible of a specific solution. I think now we're getting more uh, specialization and companies playing more to niches and to differentiating in those niches. So the platform environment is, is maturing quite quickly, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's very, um, uh, very healthy. And it's certainly come out of, I, I think, a lot of the initial platforms somewhat under-delivering in terms of performance because they were trying to cover such a, a broad scope. And now, the, the market, of course, for platforms, as is very natural for a new uh, technology domain, is very crowded. In your previous role, you were an analyst. I'm sure you spent a lot of time studying this market. Do you expect there to be some uh, significant degree of consolidation in the, in the coming two to three years? Or do you think that it's going to kind of continue to be a very vibrant uh, uh, blue ocean environment for, for some amount of time? I do think it's going to be quite a vibrant and diverse group of platforms. What you have got happening, though, in the background is is the gradual emergence of standards. Now, I don't think that 
standards again to keep up with the creativity of IoT business models. So I don't think that we're ever we're going to get to a completely standardized environment for a very long time or a significantly long time. But you do have that creeping standardization. And what that does is does drive an element of consolidation and it underpins in many ways scale advantages and competing on elements of propositions such as you know the diversity of geographic locations of a platform uh, rather than the you know the actual functionality of, of an AEP for example so yes I think it is it is going to consolidate down not quickly and it'll be very vibrant and very diverse for, for quite a long time to come I think Final question, Jim. Nokia's platform, what does this offering from Nokia look like today if, if we um, use Nokia to an extent uh, as, a, as an example of you know, what, uh, what they have built and, and put out into the, the marketplace? How would you kind of define that? And, and if you can share a little bit of the insight into the, the process of figuring out what the right solution is and, and, uh, and bringing that to market. And you, know, you could say this maybe would be a little bit of an application case from the uh, BSIF. So Nokia plays across many areas in this space, starting from the starting from the bottom level in the stack, effectively, or the bottom level in the stack as viewed from a communications person's uh, perspective, is Wing. That's my division. So that's a that that's a multi-country, multi-technology agnostic connectivity platform. You know, delivers connectivity um, in a homogenous way anywhere, effectively. That's one level. Sitting on top of that, we we have uh, Nokia Software, which is much more around uh, device management and application enablement. We have applications sitting on top of that. We have an applications place, specific niche applications in areas such as supply chain or smart cities. And we've got some of the more horizontal components that are quite relevant in the IoT space, such as you know artificial intelligence, machine learning, and remote monitoring and maintenance, etc. So we have quite a broad set of capabilities in the IoT space. Is there anything on the horizon that you'd be able to point out that we, we could maybe expect in, in 12 to 24 months? Or, you know, if it's not a particular product, maybe uh, just a kind of a trend or, um, you know, in terms of adoption uh, or, or use case uh, adoption that you think would be interesting for, for people to be paying attention to? I think we're getting to the point where um, many areas of IoT are getting traction. So I think the term IoT has been commonplace probably for five or six years. When I first put IoT on business cards in 2011, we thought I meant interoperability testing. So yeah, it, it's quite a recent term. So there's been a lot of talk about the potential. I think there are a number of areas where it's really getting to be real now. So fleet management, supply chain, intelligent factories, smart cities. Those are the things that really come to mind as parts of IoT that are really getting traction and coming mainstream, I think, uh, becoming commonplace. So I'm expecting to see more of that in the next 12 months. Just we're getting to that inflection in the curve where um, we're not looking to the future so much, but quite widespread adoption for many of these solutions, I think. Yeah, we had a, a workshop last night. And as an activity, we had people from many different industries. So we had about 20 people covering probably 10 different industries. And we had a discussion around digitalization, how it's impacting your business. And at the beginning, people were, you know, these guys are not coming from technology. They're coming from the business side. They're saying, well, we don't, I don't really know what digitalization is and so forth. But then we went through an activity of imagining your business today, you know, listing some set of technologies and then imagining how your business might look like. And kind of from a bottom up perspective, they actually had a lot of very coherent ideas in terms of either what their business was doing today or, or what could be done. And I think we're, we're certainly getting to the point where even if people are still a little bit fuzzy, which is kind of natural because it's a very huge, you know, it's a very large ephemeral concept, digitalization or IoT. So maybe that, uh, that high level concept is still a bit fuzzy. But uh, from a bottom up perspective, people are starting to identify specific use cases that make sense that they've, they've seen in the world. And I think that's a very healthy thing because end of the day, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about just finding solutions to problems. That's where it gets real. When IoT moves out of the domain of the, the technologists and the vendors and is adopted by, I know, people who run art galleries or coffee shops, you know, begin to wonder what it is that could be done with these digital transformation and IoT technologies, that's when it really takes off. Well, it's going to be an interesting uh, future. And uh, Jim, thank you for, for the hard work and helping to provide some clarity in terms of you know, how we might better create that future. So, uh, and, and thanks for taking the time today. I really enjoyed the discussion. No problem. And thanks for inviting me into this dialogue. It's been an interesting conversation. The best way for somebody to get in, involved with uh, BSIF or, or to reach out, is it typically that they should get in touch with Kathy or, 
What's your preferred if somebody just wants to learn more about the work that you guys are doing over in the in the working group? Well, the BSIF is published, so anybody can surf over to the IOC's website, which is iaconsortium.org, and there there's a list of resources and technical papers, and there you'll find the, the BSIF and many other publications from the IOC. So that's one level. You, you read the document, take it away, use it as, as you can. We are continuing work in this, in this same space uh, within the business strategy task group within the IAC and also within business strategy and solution lifecycle. And if you actually want to get engaged in that work and involved in that work and, and in the discussions and, and contribute to, to the next wave of deliverables and, and, and contribute and influence the thinking, you know, we'd love you to be involved, but you'd have to be a member of the IOC first. So the thing to do would be to join the IOC, or if you are already members, then just join the group calls and, and, and working sessions and, and feel free to contribute. Perfect. And we'll put all of that in the show notes. Jim, thanks so much for the time. Thank you very much. This episode of the IoT Spotlight was brought to you by the Industrial Internet Consortium. To learn more about their joint test beds, white papers, and other collaborative activities, visit www.iiconsortium.org or reach out to me directly and I'll be happy to make an introduction. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Industrial IoT Spotlight. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at IoT1HQ and to check out our database of case studies on IoT1.com. If you have unique insight or a project deployment story to share, we'd love to feature you on a future edition. Write us at eric.walenza at iot1.com.